Hello everybody and welcome to another video that I am doing here. This is in a video series. This is video number four, I believe. And today we're going to be talking about when it feels like God isn't there. Um, I haven't done one in a while and we are in my dorm room. I, I moved back to college when I started this at home and now I'm back at college. And um, it's been a blessing being here. It's really been encouraging. And uh, but we're going to be talking about when it feels like God isn't there. And um, even this semester, I've had times where I, I go into my prayer room that's over here on our floor, and I just sit there and I kneel before God, and I, I doesn't even feel like I'm speaking to anyone, you know. And you know, I it, I came to Moody Bible Institute here, and you know, there's points where I'm like, did I actually come here for a reason? Is, is you know, like can't, I can't even feel God sometimes. Is, is there? Am I doing this just foolishly? Like, what? Can I really feel God? And um, maybe you guys can relate to that. Maybe you're going through a point in life right now where you you just can't feel God when you pray. You just can't feel the Spirit like you maybe you used to. And maybe you've never even felt God's Spirit before. Maybe you've never experienced that. You never know what these Christians are talking about when they talk about God. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to emphasize this word called faith. And you may have heard of this before, may have heard of this out of the context of the Bible. But So we are going to be talking about why faith is so important, I hope to communicate that to you. I hope to communicate that this is not a blind faith that we believe in, in Christianity and in God. And I want to give you a method of faith, if you will. I want to give you a method to be able to hopefully see God more, some some symptoms of why maybe you can't feel God's presence anymore, and to hopefully encourage you so that you can draw near to God again. So to, to a biblical definition of faith we see in Hebrews 11.1. 1. And that says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So I remember, I, excuse me, I remember when I was a kid, um, we, we had a bonfire in the back of our, our yard. We had a pretty big yard and my dad would always, you know, the brush piles and the leaves, whatever it was, we'd just throw our trash back there. Not real trash, but just junk things, you know, and we'd burn it. We had a burn pile. And well, one day with the, the fire was really high. It was a, 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 just a great summer night. We were burning leaves. And I had a big ball. My, my parents just recently bought me a big ball, those Walmart balls, you know, three, four, five dollar balls that are just the big rubber balls, you know, that are just super bouncy, super fun to play with. And my dad warned me and he told me, Seth, do not play by this ball, play with this ball, throw this ball up to the air near the fire or it's going to go in the fire and it's going to pop. Now, if I had faith in my dad, what I do, I would have confidence in what we'd hope for. Or in this verse, I'd have confidence in what he says. I'd have confidence in, in, in what I believe to be true and what he says will actually come about. And I have assurance about what I do not see. I didn't tr I couldn't see in the future. You know, he couldn't see in the future. But I would trust that he knows best and that I would not play with this. That I trust, even when I can't see it, that he knows better and that I won't play with this ball in the fire, by the fire. Did I do that? No, of course not. I kept on playing with the ball in the fire. Eventually, a gust of wind took the ball, went into the fire, and it burned. <laughs> I was so sad. I, I was almost crying. I was so sad that this, this ball that my parents just bought. And a consequence of not having faith, my dad yelled at me. But that's a whole different thing. But that is what faith is. Putting our full trust, our full faith, believing and putting in faith actions that we believe in God's word and this command. And... Uh, so, so why is faith so important? Kind of an understanding of faith now. So the first point I have for why is faith is important is because we are saved through faith. And I, I want to distinguish that faith is different from believing. Okay, so James 2.19 says, You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You know, you can believe in God all you want. There's many of you out here who believe in God. There's a lot of demons believe in God because God is real. But they do not put their faith in him. We must put our faith into God, trust him through actions in order to be saved. Next thing on this is that, well, so, so how do we become saved? And we see in Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace you have been saved. It is God's love and grace that he, we are saved. What, but what is it through? It is through faith, it says. It is through believing in God that we are saved. So, first point, we are saved through faith. Okay, second one is you are under attack. This is why faith is so important, because you are under attack. Do you know this? And do you know how you're under attack? You may not believe it, but it's your own heart is one of the things that are under, that attacks you. And what? Let me explain this. 
Jeremiah 17, uh, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Now, our hearts are so deceptive. Oh my goodness. I could eat so many donuts before realizing that these donuts are not good for my body. That there is serious consequences to eating a whole dozen donuts every other day. Oh, donuts are so good. You know, our heart, the things it desires, it does not do just like with a conscious. It just, it, whatever it desires, it does. And often in our life, our hearts and our emotions confuse us because we are sinful. Sin has woven itself into our lives from birth and that our hearts are now deceptive. We, we can't control them. And above this, and even greater than this, in 1 Peter 5, 8, we read, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Not only is your own heart deceptive in what it believes, but the devil is real, and he is roaring around like a lion, use the metaphor here, to find someone to attack and to completely just ruin them. God, Satan does not want you to love God. Satan does not want you to have faith in God whatsoever. And he will do anything. And that's his job. We are in a spiritual warfare in this world. And in America, we don't like thinking about spiritual things as much. That There are spiritual things going on that we cannot understand in this world. Do you know that? And Satan, his job, his purpose, the devil, is to take away as many people as he can from God. And how do we defend this? We, do, we defend this through faith. And that is why faith is so important. We have to have faith in God, trust in Him, so our hearts won't deceive us, and that the Satan won't take over us. And thirdly, another reason that faith is so important, because it helps us through our trials. Okay, in Hebrews 11, that was the verse that we talked about that had the definition of faith in it. It goes through and it talks about just saints and prophets in the Old Testament and how through faith... They trust in God, and they overcame their situations. They overcame their trials. Oh, I, I, I can't talk about in this, but I'd love for you to read that chapter. In verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive at his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Okay, in Genesis 12, we're going to the Old Testament now. Abraham believed God. And in Genesis 12, we read that the Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse you. I will curse. God said, God chose Abraham. Abraham is the founding father of Christianity and of Israel. God chose Abraham, and he said, I want to make you into a great nation. And he says, Go from your country, your people, to a place that I will show you. And what does Abraham do? He goes. He doesn't complain. He doesn't. He trusts in God. He has faith. And as we read farther in Hebrews 11 and 9, it says, By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. He went to a place far from his home. He left his house, left everything. And he started living in tents in this promised land, trusting, having faith in God, that he would provide something out of this, that he would say and trust his word. And there's so many more examples. That's just one. But in Hebrews 11, there are so many more examples of how God has provided and brought us through our trials. And I even want to, like, look at yourself, you know, as God brought you through trials. And that's through faith. Remember those things. So that, that's a little portion. Okay, so that is why faith is important. Faith is incredibly important for many reasons. And I, next point here is that this is not a blind faith we believe in. You may have heard this thing, you know, you may have had genuine questions before about Christianity or about the Bible, and questions are good. Ask questions. You may have had a question like, did God really create this universe? I learned this thing in science class that says, you know, God didn't create it, and the Bible says God did create it. How, how can that be? Explain that to me. You may have been just asking where am I supposed to go to college, God? You know, you don't know these answers. It's hard to believe. And, and you know what a response usually is? Someone from the church usually say, just have faith in God. Just, just believe in God. Just have blind faith, and he will provide. He'll bring it to you. It's good for us to have faith, but this is not a blind faith. This is a faith rooted in God's word. 
So point, the first point I want to make to this, that this is not blind faith, is that Jesus was a real man. We know this. If you've seen my other videos, I've made a whole video about how Jesus is real. But in this book here, it says that from the Bible, the Bible demonstrates that Jesus did really die. Crucifixion assures death, as did the Roman soldiers who were professional executioners. Numerous witnesses, both friends and foes, saw him die. The spear to his side with the blood and water assured his death. His death cry was heard by those who stood by, and Pilate made sure Jesus was dead before he gave the body for burial. Jesus was a real person. Wikipedia even believes that. Like, come on now. Jesus actually died. This is a real fact. And we see, and as this book goes on, on top of all this, modern medical authorities have confirmed that Jesus actually died. The Journal of the American Medical Association said that the spear, and when they, they put a spear through Jesus' chest, it, they go on to explain that truly did kill him. That, that is medically sound. Jesus was real. He actually did die. And the same historically reliable New Testament documents, the Bible, also reveals that Jesus actually rose from the dead bodily. Indeed, not only did he leave an empty grave and grave clothes behind, but he appeared in the same physical body with the crucifixion scars to over 500 people on 12 different occasions during a 40-day period. During those 40 days, people saw, heard, and touched him. Some ate with him. And it goes on. Jesus not only died, but he rose again. We see this in the Bible. This is a real fact. And not only that, if you don't believe that, after that, his followers became the world's greatest missionaries, the greatest missionary society overnight. We, we see this proven that in society, if you go back and look in the history books, there's a huge explosion during Jesus' life and death. Right after his death, a huge explosion in the culture, a complete society change. There's no reason. That is because Jesus was real. He was a real man. A next point, and, and oh, there are so many great things that prove that, you know, this is not a blind faith, that Christianity is real. I'm just going to go for, through a few here, but there are so many others, just to let you know. And another point is that look to examples of Christians. In Hebrews 11, read the Old Testament. There are such good nuggets. And I, I will admit, I just read through the, the full Old Testament last semester. And it's tough. It's long, you know. But it is so rewarding, I will encourage you. Find accountability and read it with someone. Oh, it is so good. And we see these stories of how God, you know, people have been believing in God for 4,000 years. Do you know that? In Jesus Christ, they've been believing in this God for 4,000 years. As, you know, this is not something new. This Bible is not just new. It's just not a new belief that we think of. It is grounded in this world for over 4,000 years. And all throughout the church history, all throughout our history, people have believed in this. It's not just something that's sparked up. It has history to it. And that is so... And a lot of these religions are popping up now. You know, where were they beforehand? Why weren't they, why weren't they discovered beforehand? Christianity has passed the time constraint you know he has been here since the beginning of time and you know even look to examples in your own life of christians okay i, I want you to like e evaluate do you know a christian in your life have you seen me live out my life some of you who just know me as a christian christ has changed my life look to people who are christians and i, I will admit there's a lot of christians who do a lot of bad things and even beyond 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 bad things and that is that is just awful but there are true Christians living out God's word, and they are changed. I am changed. I'm a new being. I'm not the old person I used to be. I'm changed. Look to these Christians. Have you had an experience like this? You know, th this, this is not a blind faith. This is a faith that moves people. And thirdly, look to the spiritual side of things when believing in faith. You know, it, it's not a blind faith. There's facts that back it up. But also in Romans 1.20, we see that for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. God demonstrates himself through the supernatural. Some of you have probably experienced supernatural things. I believe that. And I believe that was either God or Satan. And there is a real, that is real here. And look, look at nature, it says. By his eternal power and divine nature. Look at nature. Go look outside. Who created that? It must have been a creator. There must have been. It's just, oh, it's so crazy. Oh, it's so beautiful. There, there must be a creator. And um, look to the spiritual side things with faith. God reveals to himself. This is not a blind faith. This is a faith that you do experience sometimes.
And okay, I have to continue on, but so faith is important. We read about that and we just went through this is not a blind faith, this is faith that you can root yourself in, you can root yourself in the Bible, it's real. So now I have a method for faith, if you will. I don't want to call it that, but Hebrews 12, the, the next chapter after Hebrews 11, talks about a be at Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 is what I'm going to read here. And I think it has four beautiful notes, few, four beautiful things that shows you, that explains why you may not be able to feel God's presence right now. Okay, so I'm going to read it, and then we're going to depict it a little bit. So Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's jump into this right now. So I'm going to give you four points, and I really want you to, this is where you apply. This is practically where you can apply this faith. Okay, so first point here. Sorry, I gotta fix my hair again. It's too long. I'll tell you. First point. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, point number one: look to the past and how God has moved. What is this verse saying here? It's pointing to Hebrews eleven. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, this means the 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 witnesses who have professed Christianity, professed in God before we were born. I want you to look at the things I profess. And only, not only just the people, but look at the Bible, God's Word. In this book, I'll, I'll put it in the um, comments or whatever you do it in. Um, it says, The Bible is composed of 66 books written over a period of some 1,500 years by nearly 40 authors in several languages containing hundreds of topics. Yet the Bible possesses an amazing unity of theme, Jesus Christ. And I'll say that we still have it here. Over all that time, over all that diversity, we still have God's word. And not only is do we have God's word, it's been proven true. And, and in the same book, it says other religious books, the other religious books that claim divine inspiration, like Islam's Quran and the Hindu Veda, contain no predictive element and make no prophecies about the future. In contrast, the Bible speaks confidently about the future. No unconditional prophecy of the Bible about events to the present day has gone unfulfilled. Hundreds of predictions, some of them given centuries in advance, have been literally fulfilled. I want you to, excuse me, look to the cr crowd of witnesses around you in the Bible. Read the Bible. Oh, it is so powerful. There are so many prophecies that come true. This Bible is true and rich. And, and, and when you look at it, you feel encouraged. And even in your own life, look to the past how God has moved you. Look to the past how God has moved other Christians in your life. We are surrounded in a community so we can be encouraged in our faith. That we can see God move in other people's lives even when our emotions trick us. Even when you know we don't feel like if something terrible happens and we, we can't trust in God. That God is still moving around us and in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament. 2,000 years ago in history. Okay, second point. So, so let me read again. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that was point one, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily tangles. Point number two is throw off every sin and hindrance in your life. That's a lot. And let me explain this. So do you know what 1 John 1.11 says? 1 John 1.11 says, but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. I want to be honest with you guys for a little bit. And I, I, I want to explain this for you. So there has been a time in my life where I was deeply rooted in sin. I, I was trapped by sin. I could not see out of it. I could not see past the, the lust of the, my flesh. And I just felt like I couldn't escape it whatsoever. And you know why that was? And I, I didn't even know I was in sin. I didn't even realize that I was so distant from God. And you know why? It's because when we are in sin, sin is darkness. And it blinds our eyes so that we cannot see the darkness around us. We're stumbling. We, we, you know, because, because the darkness has blinded us. It blinds us to the reality of this world. And that's what sin does. It separates us from God and it blinds our eyes so that we cannot see God's presence right in front of us. 
So throw off every sin in your life. What what you sins are things that are against God's word. And more often than not, I believe that you know what sins are causing in your life. Is there something that's separating you from God? Is there a sin? Think about that. Get rid of it. And I, I tell you, from someone who's you know who who's been in the deep root of lust and has felt like he can't get out of it. When I, you know, just recently, when I see and my eyes are open to God's truth and the light, oh, I, I was so foolish to be in the darkness. It is not worth it, guys and girls. It's not worth it to be stuck in those things. So, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sins that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Point number three is run your race. Okay, what does God have in store for you to do? What, what is your purpose on this life? That's a big question, but let me encourage you with this, that God has created a purpose in your life. To, to run a good race, to do things, God has given you a purpose. And a good thing to find this, what I like to do, okay? I like to see what am I good at. I like to write down what am I good at, what do I love to do, and what does God want me to do. Write those three things down, and you can find an easy way to understand what God has designed me for. And there are so many little quizzes that you can do, but what has God, you think, designed you for? What has he prepared you for? What situations, circumstances, communities he put you in to prepare you for? In an overarching theme we see in Ephesians 2.10 for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Above all, you're prepared and created to do good works, to do God's work. Go do it. Be encouraged. Go do something that you're eager to do. Go do something that you're eager to do that will glorify God. That, that is so cool. And run your race. Don't compare yourself to others, by the way. Don't run someone else's race. God's given you a path. God's given you a race. Don't try to run someone else's race. Don't compare yourself saying, oh, if I can only be like this person. That's not the race God's given you. God's given you a specific race. Run that. And point number four, so we, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Point number four, fix your eyes on Jesus. Oh, and above all, th this is the point I want to get at. Seek God and seek Jesus. And in Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I believe that if you pray to God, and maybe you feel like you can't, you can't feel God's presence when you pray to Him. Maybe it's another thing, but don't just pray to pray. Pray to seek God. Read God's word to seek Jesus. Look for him in that. And, and this is what it says. He's the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. That when our emotions tell us something else, when, when Satan's attacking us, that we can be rooted in God's word and seek him and feel God's presence still. And even if we can't feel it, we know it to be true. And... Oh, those four points, evaluate them, evaluate your life. And I'll tell you, above all else, there are times when we, when we don't feel like worshiping God, when, when sometimes when we can't feel like God. And that is when faith comes in. And that is when faith is so important. Because faith is, is, is not by sight. We live by faith, not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says. Because there are, there are times when God will reward us and reveal himself to us. But I want you to live your life by faith. And that as, as you evaluate your life in these four points, and may, maybe you're doing one of these off, and you need to repent to God of your sins and turn back to Him. And, and you know, you need to get rid of these things that you keep on distracting yourself with and turn to God. Do those things. But ultimately, it stems from faith. And when we have faith in God, we will, we will know God's there even if we can't necessarily feel it. And that, that's the message I have for you today. That is God's Word. And is true. And I've been praying for you guys who have watched this. Day. I know it ran a little bit long today, but hey, God, God, I hope God spoke to you. And um, I, I'll, I'll put all the, the notes and the verses that I um, have in the little box that I have that I can type things. And um, reach out to me if you ever need to, guys. But um, that, that's how I feel about when it feels like God isn't there. You know, you have faith, and biblical faith is good. And uh, thank you guys, and um, I'll, I'll be making another video here soon, so...